supported. Right. Um, I'll introduce the board of directors. I am Michael Rowley. This is Tasha Woods. We have Jonathan Henderson, Madeline DeMaitinon. We're joined by Superintendent, Superintendent Ginger Haber, Director of Finance, Kim Snyder, and Director of Student Services, Kelly Krombauer. And we also have Josephine Shepner, our student rep with us. Move on to consent agenda. Move that we accept the consent agenda. I second. Tasha has moved that we accept the consent agenda and Jonathan has second. Uh, a call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. I would also like to clarify that our other board member is online with us. So Chester White is online. Can we do a sound check just to make sure we can hear him? Or you can hear? Jason, could you unmute yourself? Okay. Good evening. Yes, I can hear you. I also would like to acknowledge that um, Deb, Deborah, Debbie White is going to be uh, resigning this year. She spent 25 years, all but two at ESD. She was a school psychologist and a past teacher. So thank you for your service. Board, now we move on to administration. Thank you. We have some wonderful guests here with us um, tonight. You know, we have some uh, wonderful guests with us tonight. Not sure why it's doing that. Testing. Oh, I think we got it cured. Thank you. So, board, we've got some exciting guests with us here tonight, uh, and I'd like to start out uh, with um, Alexandra um, Epstein Soulfield. She just uh, got awarded an amazing grant that is gonna uh, really support healthy foods in our schools and uh, being able to cook more from scratch. Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you, Ginger, for having me here tonight. I am excited to share a new opportunity that we've got uh, coming to us in the child nutrition department. Within the child nutrition industry, Chef Ann is a really big name. Um, all of us in child nutrition recognize her for what she's done with scratch cooking, farm to school, sustainability in schools. And in September, I applied for her Get Schools Cooking Grant. It ends up being worth around $200,000 with the technical assistance that's provided as well as travel to training events, sending uh, representatives from their foundation out to us, and then some equipment grant money. And this will start next school year. It's a three-year program. We were chosen as their fifth cohort, so this is the fifth time they've done this. And we are one of seven schools across the country that was chosen. The only other school from Washington State that's ever participated was Bellingham School District in their first cohort. Uh, so it's a big honor. We're really excited. It was a pretty extensive application process. And Ginger was part of the interview with me, which was great to show she's really supportive and involved with this initiative. 
Uh, it really is meant for us to just have some assistance as we transition to more of a whole food scratch cooking model. And we've done that a little bit on our own in the last year post COVID-19. And these are some photos of things we've done this year, which is incorporating a lot more farm to school, a lot more scratch cooking, uh, working with local farmers. And we have a dietitian who's working with us as well, uh, creating menus and training staff. Uh, and so we have a training next month in Bellingham for three days. We'll go up there and spend that with the foundation to get started. And it's like an orientation. So it will officially start next year. A lot more will be coming out about that in the next couple of months. Chef Ann hasn't officially made their announcement, uh, but we should see that in the next few weeks. And I'll continue to share information on our Facebook page with Ginger and uh, the administrative team and keep you all posted on how that goes, but I'm excited. Yeah, it's everything. Well, we're really excited about um, Thank you. Just, you, you already do such a great job. I mean, I think I shared with you, I talked with a parent and uh, he said he really liked a lot about our schools, but especially the fresh salad bar that's available for students, because that isn't, you know, in place every, everywhere. And I know it takes a lot of extra work for that. So I think you're just really intentional about that. And we just really appreciate you for that. Or do you have any questions for her about her grant? I just want to... I just want to say thank you. Uh, this is really exciting. And one of seven schools is incredible uh, in the nation. And your Facebook posts have been really informative and, cool. and fun to watch. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right, thank you so much. Next, I'd like to recognize uh, Haley Nabojcik. She uh, worked so hard. I've been to um, several of the amazing assemblies that you put on, Haley, and it's just truly remarkable all about the amount of planning and variety and just really always trying to honor people and their dignity and, and uh, giving people a chance to share their stories. And I think that that's really powerful and life-changing for students and staff when, whenever we have that opportunity to hear each other's stories. And uh, I didn't get to go to the Martin Luther King uh, assembly, but I watched the video and you shared that with me. And uh, when I watched that, I had a chance to see uh, Levi Teasley, who is also, we're very excited to have with us tonight, uh, share his story. So do you wanna talk a little bit about the assembly? And then uh, Levi, we'd love to have you come up and, and share your story with the board. Absolutely. Um... The Martin Luther King Assembly is by far the most anxiety inducing of all of the assemblies for me. Um, it is such an important topic, right? Like celebrating the life of Dr. King while also addressing, you know, race and character and just how we treat each other. Um, and so that's a hard balance to get right with the 14 to 18 year old crowd. And it's especially difficult in a assembly format. Uh, it's cool because everybody hears the same, they hear the same message. They don't always get the same message from it. Um, it's also, there's not a lot of talk, like there's not an opportunity for dialogue, right? Like there's not an opportunity to address when something is misstated or, um, you know, so it's got to be right. And at my poor exec board, after Veterans Day, we start, um, you know, we talk about it with the ASB, like the student council, we talk, um, they read and reread and reread and reread the script, um, you know, and so it just, it's one of those ones that we work really hard to get right. And some, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Um, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by very intelligent people and very, you um, people who were dedicated to their jobs, right? Warren Murray jumps in with the band. Um, they just finished a concert before they went to break and two days into the new year, they are playing you know, music for the assembly the next week. Um, and the same Gaya and the choirs, they jump in and they participate. We were fortunate to find students to um, read poetry. And, you know, so, the reality is uh, I get to do the coordinating, but it's really um, so much of the success of the event is on the guest speaker that we get. And 
we lucked out with Mr. Teasley. Um, he knocked it out of the park. He made me look like a genius. <laughs> That's hard to do. So he gets a lot of credit, um, you know, but he really like his message connected with the students who have had him in the past. You know, he's got two daughters, um, great kids at the high school. And I think, you know, he just everybody can connect to Mr. Teasley and he delivered a really just powerful, um, you know, he and I went to high school at the same time and there were some things I went, oh my gosh, um, you know, it was hard to hear as somebody who I looked up to Levi and Stephanie. Um, and so to hear, you know, some of his feelings about how things went in high school uh, was hard. So hopefully other people got that from from the assembly as well. So I don't want to take up too much more time. I'm going to turn it over to him, but appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk about good things when we when we do them. So thank you. All right, thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, this is an abbreviated version of, of what I shared. So. I'll try not to talk for the same amount of time that I, I did at the assembly. I'll do my best. Um, but again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and share, share my story and uh, feel especially priv privileged because my daughter, Esri, who's a senior and part of the EHS ASV, she was, she kind of initiated the, Hey dad, do you think you'd want to come speak? And so I was honored um, to be able to do that. So here we go. What an opportunity to be a part of honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr and his nonviolent work during the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King was the ultimate leader for change. He was humble, he was educated, he was resilient, and he had an amazing love for others. Each, uh, each year we have the opportunity to reflect on our history as a country and an opportunity to reflect on how Martin Luther King Jr.'s story and his legacy connects with our story today. How can we continue the work that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did in our country? right here in Ellensburg, Washington, and the communities we are part of. Ask yourself the question, how can I be a leader, love others, and take action to make a positive change today? I want to share some of my story and some of the lessons I've learned over the years from Martin Luther King Jr. and other role models in my life, how their stories have changed mine. The Bulldogs have a special place in my heart. I spent 16 years as a health and fitness teacher at EHS, working with amazing people and students I love. Four years as a student at EHS, graduating class of 1999. I had, an amazing, uh, I had amazing teachers who challenged me, cared about me, and helped me grow as a person. Mr. Hall, Mr. Johnson, and Mr. Affalter, to name a few. Thank you for challenging me to learn, to be a better human, and giving me different perspectives. Each and every one of you have leaders and role models in your life, whether it be at home, in school, or the activities you are involved in. Personally, as a teacher, I took the opportunity to be a positive role model for the EHS student body seriously, and I take it seriously now as I teach at Valley View to pay for the dedication that teachers had before me. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I know the job is not only to teach my content area of health and fitness, but to love kids to demonstrate how to be a positive man who is kind to all, leads with humility, speaks up for what is right, and works hard to do the best for all students. And yes, as a biracial man, I know it is important for me to be a positive role model that students of color can see a reflection of themselves in. I've been a part of the Ellensburg community for 37 years and proudly call this place home. I'm currently teaching physical education at Valley View Elementary, as I just mentioned, and working with a team of great people who are modeling, shaping, and loving the next generation of Bulldogs. I have the opportunity to be a positive male role model to the students in our district early in their life and education. My hope and prayer is that our team can give the kids in our community a boost so that they are further prepared for middle school and high school and for life. When you think of a role model, who comes to mind in your life in Dr. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech, 
He says, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. As I read these words from Dr. King, I think of the great work, hope, and sacrifice he made so that his children and other children could live in a better, live a better life than his generation. What a role model his kids had. Their dad marching, speaking, persevering through hurt, through hate and hurt to fight for what was right for a better future. His life ended because of the great hate of others that were against his cause, but his cause did not and will not end with his life. As shared earlier, I have role models in my life that I've sacrificed to make my life better. The greatest example being my parents. I was blessed to grow up with mom and dad in the home. I was born in 1980 in Seattle, Washington, living in Federal Way, Washington, while I was very little, and then moving to Ellensburg in 1985. My parents made the decision to move from Federal Way to Ellensburg would be the best for my family, for our family, and a great place for my siblings and I to grow up. My dad's job brought us to Ellensburg. My parents spent long hours providing for our family. Even with our long hours of work, with their long hours of work, they still took the time to be part of me and my siblings' lives, growing, going to all of our school and sport events, taking us on family vacations, praying for us, and talking us through hard times in our lives. They put my siblings and I first and loved us with all they had. My parents did everything in their power to make our lives better, to raise the level of life for me and my siblings. The same thing Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to do for his children. My parents' ceiling became the springboard, became my springboard for life and a future. They wanted my experience as a kid to be better than their experiences when they were young. I had a great childhood, so many great memories. It wasn't until I was older that I realized how blessed I was to have two loving parents, but to have a black dad and a white mom. I will admit, I forgot sometimes when I was young that my dad was black and maybe just unaware, not knowing any different. Even in a community where there are not many black people, I was aware my dad might, might, I was unaware that my dad might stand out a little bit. I was unaware that I might look a little different being one of the few, if not the only biracial kid in the school. My parents didn't talk about race much, and I never heard my parents complain about their lives or their past. I did ask my parents about their family history, wanting to gain understanding about my parents' experiences growing up, learning and gaining even more thankfulness for the life I have. Look at my, my, looking at my family's origin on both my mom and dad's sides, there's a lot of diversity that informs my story. My dad grew up in the South in Nashville, Tennessee, in a black neighborhood. Born in 1946, he experienced segregation. He didn't have all the same opportunities I had growing up. He made sure my experience was different. My dad came to the Northwest from Nashville, Tennessee, after he was done with high school and joined the Air Force, trying to make a better life for himself. Later, meeting my mom. Thinking of all the details through my family history that had to happen in order for me to exist is crazy. God's hand was in it the whole time. One thing I know about my mom and dad is that they modeled so much grace, forgiveness, perseverance, and hard work through everything that they had been through in their life. They have been the greatest role models for me. They have taught me to speak up for what is right, to have grace but not put up with maltreatment, to be proud of who I am, the family that I come from, to be kind, respectful, and love others, and above all, to provide for and love my family with everything I have. My dad and mom have used their life to elevate mine. Now I realize that not everyone listening right now has a family with positive role models in their home. I want to stress again the importance of finding that role model in the communities that you are part of. Some of the role models that I have had in my life, we didn't agree on everything. It's important as we grow, as we grow in our story that we have people that help us gain new perspectives to learn from and that we even disagree with sometimes or maybe often. People that call us out when we make bad decisions. Do you have a person in your life that loves you enough to keep you accountable, speaks truth to you, and shares new perspectives? There were times in my life when I wanted nothing more than to get out of Helensburg. God knew that my family and I needed to be here. 
I do love Ellensburg. This community continues to be a great place to live and raise a family. My roots are deep. This is a place I met my wife, my kids are growing up, my dad and much of my wife's side of the family call home. I feel loved, respected and cared for by this community. Even in a great place like Ellensburg, nobody or place is perfect, including me. Reflecting back to my childhood, I struggled with my identity, especially in middle school and high school. Even today, my personality is one that desires peace and acceptance by others. I don't like conflict. Now, I did have a lot of good friends and some best friends growing up. Again, that didn't mean everything was perfect. I can remember moments in my childhood being called names by people trying to bring me down for being a biracial. I had a lot of insecurity because I looked different. I would walk down the halls as a teenager with a long coat covering my backside because I was built differently. My head would be down. I lacked confidence. I didn't want any extra attention on me. I was part of jokes from my childhood teammates that they would make comments about my athleticism being connected with being black. I would just laugh it off, but inside believe the lie and question my worth. Because of hard work, great coaches and family support, I had a lot of success as a student athlete. Sports continued to be a big part of my life. I had the opportunity to play college football at Central Washington University. My CW team was very diverse and refreshingly a bit of a shock after growing up in Ellensburg. This was a new and welcome experience for me that came with new challenges. I had another identity crisis in, in college, trying to figure out where I fit. I had questions going on in my head. Did I need to act a certain way? How did people see me? After lots of struggles, I had some growth in college, growing in confidence and pride in who I am, learning more about who I was as a person, making my story seem a bit more clear. I started to own the pride I had for my background, my story, and becoming more fully myself. Along with this, getting out of my comfort zone and making new friends and strengthening friendships with old friends, ultimately surrounding myself with people who love me for me, but aren't afraid to speak the truth and hold me accountable. I guarantee there are students here in our schools and people in our community that need another person to see them, to get to know them, to learn to be curious about their story. Can you get out of your comfort zone and make a difference in another person's life? It's as simple as asking a question. In college, I made one of the biggest and best decisions of my life. At age 21, married my high school sweetheart, who was 19 at the time, the most beautiful woman alive, my best friend who loved me for me and most definitely challenged me and continues to challenge me. My wife inspires me to speak up, to be a leader, to work hard, and to love big. My wife and I had our own struggles as a young married couple with loved ones not agreeing with our marriage, not because we were young, but because they thought two people of different racial backgrounds should not get married. This prejudice hurt because I was only being judged by my appearance and not by the content of my character. Yet in spite of this hurdle, this major hurdle, we have been married 21 and a half years and been together for 25 years. We have three beautiful children. There has been a lot of healing in our family since we got married. This healing could not have come without some very tough and uncomfortable conversations, support from our loved ones, lots of forgiveness, patience, humility, and choosing to love in the midst of hurt. As I shared earlier, my parents raised the level of life for me my and my siblings. I have the opportunity to raise the level of life for my children. It wasn't until becoming a dad, seeing the face of my children for the first time, my story embedded in theirs, that I realized a powerful love that would never cease for them. The love I have for my children is greater than I can describe. Even after all of the work of Martin Luther King Jr., the recent events in our country have, hi have highlighted that much change still needs to happen. There's still social injustice, prejudice, and hate darkening our stories. We need to counter that hate by speaking up for what is right, being curious first before making judgment always being a learner, educating each other, and helping those in need. To remember, we are all human. As we learn about each other, especially those who are different from us, this is when we will start to see lasting change. This change will likely feel uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable loving family and friends who saw me as different or not enough. 
We need to humbly love each other, each other well, and simply put, put others before ourselves. I have an opportunity and a platform as a father and teacher to positively impact my kids and the lives of other kids. For kids to see a man who looks like me and gives them confidence and hope that they can do great things in their life too. Martin Luther King Jr., the man, the father, the ultimate humble leader and example for us all, he didn't let fear get in the way of taking action and doing what was right, not with violence, but with humility and resilience. Martin Luther King Jr.'s story directly impacted my dad's life and my parents' life together. I would not be here without my mom and dad's story. Now my story gets to elevate my kid's story in the same positive way. How are you going to use your story to make a positive, not negative change in others' lives? Now is not the time to be colorblind, but to be curious about each other's stories, to celebrate our differences, to love each other and work together to make change that will last for generations. EHS and the Ellensburg community and Ellensburg School District, you get to be the change Martin Luther King Jr. wanted to see in this world. Will you use your story to make it happen? Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Levi. Oh, I don't know how to follow up with that. Lord, do you have any questions for Levi? Or for Thank you? you very much, Levi Haley. That that's a very, very. Thank you. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Levi. It really means a lot to have you come and share with us. So thank you. And thank you for the difference that you make in the lives of our children every day. Um, so we had our board, we had our first um, budget reduction reallocation meeting that went well. We talked about the overall process. We outlined the norms. The PowerPoint is posted under board committees on our uh, website and I took uh, some of the people had questions and we're in the process of getting uh, putting some responses to those and all of that we're hoping to be have posted on the website uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, we'll just give it more detailed uh, information on kind of where we're at with the survey data at the next board meeting. The survey uh, was closed the beginning of this week, and we're just starting to kind of sort through it. Um, and um, I think Madeline and Mike, you guys will be able to do it on the 14th, along with um, Tom Fleming and Kevin Chase coming together to look at it. So that'll be it. Uh, the other thing I want to share is that uh, the Ed Foundation does have, we have a fundraiser coming up on February 10th at the Tianaway Hall Kittitas Valley Event Center. And um, Maureen Russ did a great job of uh, putting in an article in the newspaper, um, but the foundation just really did a lot of great things for our students this year, uh, every year. But this year uh, there was uh, $8,773.35 uh, that was uh, given away uh, on different projects that were uh, shared with the foundation. Uh, that directly help our students and, and our teachers. So for example, at Ida Nason uh, Elementary, uh, there was uh, a Sky Dome event. There were uh, $500 for books. Uh, at Lincoln, uh, there was money that went towards the robotics club, headphones for the Chromebooks, uh, more books for distribu distribution to students, uh, a classroom rug. We know those elementary rugs are very essential. Uh, Ozobots, I had a chance to see the Ozobots and um, they're really amazing. And I think teachers have been using it during the wind time, uh, but they literally uh, do some problem solving uh, with math. And so I don't know, maybe on one of our walkthroughs, I'll see if we can uh, come upon some Ozobots. Mount Stewart uh, had, uh, it was $500 for a story workshop, um, $250 for family nights at Valley View, uh, first grade teachers, $712 for their field trip to Woodland Park Zoo. Uh, at Morgan, uh, Tora Blaisdell, $789 to refurbish some cameras, uh, was for some of the work he's doing with his students. Uh, Nate Bradshaw, $500 field trip to the 
uh, UW Burt Museum of Natural History and Culture, Ellensburg High School, Tiffany Price, uh, 1,500 uh, to help uh, Technology Student Association go to their state conference for the registration. And then our Early Learning Coalition, $500 for our early learning uh, books. So uh, again, Ed Foundation is a nonprofit organization and uh, you all should have received some individual invites for the fundraiser and it's on February 10th. And I'll be back there with uh, Mike McCloskey helping out with the games. So if you're, the guys are there, come by and say hi. Encourage you guys to attend. And that's the end of my right. presentations. Thank you very much, Ginger. Uh, next up is student report. Josephine, do you have something for us? I do, thank you. Um, for my report, we have some general updates. Uh, ASB is planning a grub tolo for the beginning of February, so there's going to be two tolos. And the grub tolo has an 80s theme where kids are just supposed to, they can show up with a theme or they can show up in casual clothes or matching t-shirts with their partner. And it's just a chance to talk and have fun without having to dress up and get all fancy. Um, girls basketball is also doing really good right now. Um, we've been playing, we got these new jackets that Kanye was talking about when uh, one time when he was here. Um, and it, it was really cool to be able to match with the basketball team and people in the K-9 unit and kind of feel more united. Um, and pep band's been going well with that as well. Um, from the band, we have Allstate coming up and we also have solo and ensemble coming up. So kids have been working pretty hard on their music. Um, the Student Senate, we had a meeting on Thursday, a couple <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Um, and we had to have it on a day we normally don't have it. Um, so less people showed up, but we were still really productive and it was good to see that we were still able to be productive with less people. We were able to create a project proposal uh, for something we we're gonna call Coffee and Connections. Um, our topic is the teacher-student connection. And the purpose is to allow students to get to know their teachers better and to be able to relate to them. Uh, in turn, this will help build an environment where teachers feel more appreciated and students feel more understood. The intended audience is teachers and the student senate. Our desired outcomes and impacts are to improve relationship um, the relationships between a student and teacher, making teachers appear more approachable and students feel more comfortable with approaching them. Um, we're going to measure this impact. Uh, we were thinking, we haven't, we don't know for sure, but we were thinking it would be good um, to have an article written uh, in a school newspaper about how the project went and get feedback from teachers as well as students. Um, we were also thinking of being able to interview students in the hallways and seeing if they're feeling more connected with their teachers um, and if that's helping. Um, we're going for implementing this plan. We're going to use uh, computers. So we might use a Google document to keep track of this. Um, paper printouts, a list of all the staff at EHS. And we're, our plan is to give out coffee and possibly breakfast items, so donut holes or something of that sort. We don't know for sure, but we just something to say thank you to the teachers and the staff as well, not just teachers. So we're going to need uh, materials for that as well. Um, we're thinking this is going to be very achievable. We're going to give everyone in the student senate different tasks so that it can get done more efficiently. Um, we haven't quite created our timeline yet. Um, it's This project proposal is still in the works, especially since a lot of the student Senate members were missing in our last meeting. Um, but the time commitment for this is we'll just be planning during our student Senate meetings, and then it'll be about 45 minutes to acquire all of our materials and 30 to 45 minutes completing the project one morning before school. Um, and yeah, that's all. Thank you. Mike, I, I just have one more thing that I meant to put as part of my presentation. So board, you know, uh, Chester White, this is his very last board meeting with us. And it's so great, uh, Chester, to have you on Zoom with us. And uh, I just think, um, I just appreciate Chester. He, as the board chair, really led us through uh, a lot of difficult times, especially through the pandemic. And uh, I know I always I have just always appreciated Chester for uh, being just a great thought partner uh, for giving me feedback, uh, very timely feedback to, to help me uh, keep moving uh, things forward with our district. 
And so I just thought we could just take time since uh, Chester, this is your last meeting, uh, just to share our appreciation for him. So board, if there's anything that you would like to share, that I give you a chance to do that. I will just say a quick thank you that um, being new to the board, he was very helpful. And so I appreciated all the kind of guidance that he gave me. And so it's kind of really sad to see you go, Chester, because now I'm in your seat. Um, <laughs> no, uh, but thank you very much for all the guidance that you uh, helped with me being a new board member and uh getting more comfortable with this position, so. I am thankful for uh, Chester, Jason White, um, for, for being willing to have a seat at the table um, and for his reflective, pragmatic, solution-oriented um, ways that he always brought to the discussions. Um, but it, I would like to note that in leaving the school board, he had to change his name and move to a different state. So I think that might be correlated. <laughs> it's tough to uh, see him go because he's been such a critical part of the community and the school board. Um, and for the school board, I feel like he really kept us to moving forward together. And that's kind of tough with a lot of very different opinions. and what we've been through the past couple of years. So thank you, Jason. Yeah, I just want to say thank you too, because uh, you made it a lot easier at, with all my questions and stuff. So uh, I really appreciate you kind of welcoming to, me to the school board this year. And then I think the real question is, it's still pretty frosty here. So how is it there in Arizona? <laughs> it is actually colder right now. So. Okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you all. You did not need to thank me. I want to thank you all because you all are the ones that do all the hard work uh, moving things forward. I hope the community will continue to understand all the hard work that you all have to do. Um, and I wish you all the best. Uh, I think I think EST is in good hands. So best of best wishes to you all. Thank you, Chester. All right, and thank you, Josephine, for your report. You guys always come very, very prepared, so it's great. Um, that takes us on to business. So, board, uh, you had a chance to hear uh, Rhonda Schmidt's outline of the new program, the Home Connections Program. And uh, so we would like to ask uh, the board to formally approve that program. So Rhonda's here, and she's just going to kind of give you an update where she's at with it. and. I think you have their teacher here, right? That's going to do it. So if you have some, I have a special guest, Deanna yeah. Barnum here. So there's not a, a ton of updates since I just spoke to you about two weeks ago. Um, the, the biggest news is that um, Ellensburg Choice Schools, our, our alternative programs, does have a website up now. It's available on the drop down menu so that um, pending approval, if the board chooses to approve going forward with the Home Connections program, the next step would be. Um, multiple two-way information nights. So for me to talk about what we can offer to community and to hear what the community would like from us for if they want to um, participate in a, a homeschool partnership with us. So that's really the plan. I do have a teacher identified who has experience with homeschooling and has been in the community for a long time. I don't know if you have any questions for um, her or me. She's a current Excel teacher. And I think I mentioned, I'm just um, moving around some, some staff. My current PLC teacher is going to be joining Excel and Deanne will be um, at least hopefully full-time in the home connection. We'll, we'll see this depends on enrollment. Deanne, I'd love to just hear about your experiences in, in your last place and, and why you're a proponent of this uh, model. Well, as a community member myself with four students, well, four kids, uh, they became my students during the pandemic because I did homeschool them for an amount of time, which uh, gave me the opportunity to kind of see it from the other perspective. And then last year I worked with homeschool students um, in kind of a pod situation. So it was neat to just see the different reasons that families choose homeschooling. And I feel like I could be a good resource for them and understand where they're coming from and aid them in the things that 
our district can offer to them so that it's a win-win for everyone. Gordon, does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Um, can you speak to, have you had um, uh, any homeschool parents reach out to you at this point and, or have any feelers put out as far as what, what they might be looking for? I have had a couple of questions. Um, you know, I have talked just a little bit. I think questions so far I've gotten from about three people and mostly about um, what the requirements are. And there is some misunderstanding about whether people could still continue to do um, at home homeschooling without a connection to the district. I think um, some people, there was a little bit of confusion in the article that um, appeared in the record, but um, th that's all I've heard so far. Um, I actually got a couple of questions from um, some other school districts actually. <laughs> um, so a little, little bit more questions, but I know that there's a Facebook group um, for um, active homeschoolers and there's you know, been a little chatter on there and I'll, you know, once this is approved, I'll be reaching out um, through that venue too. Uh, thank you. Your past presentations have been very um, informative and helpful. And thank you for administration and for you for bringing this forward and, and for sharing your experience too with, homes with homeschooling. Uh, homeschooling is a very real, viable educational option. And so I think it is imperative that the school district um, is supportive of that and, and is a partner in that. So thank you for presenting this program. So this is an action item. I was going to say my computer froze. So um, <laughs> board, this is an action item. I move that we approve the home connections program. I second. Tasha has moved that we approve the home connections program and Madeline has second. Call a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion is passed. Thank you very much. I'm very excited for this. Thank you both. <laughs>Next up, item B. Yep, the second one is uh, we had a great conversation as I shared on our January meeting with the budget uh, reduction reallocation um, committee. And um, we, uh, the survey was uh, stopped at the beginning of this week and we've started to kind of filter through and, and create the list of what would, what would be, you know, viable, um, measurable uh, items from that survey as opposed to ones that um, would not be measurable. So we're in the process of filtering that. Um, and um, the two uh, changes or adoptions to the process, I just, we don't have to necessarily formally vote on it, but just wanted to get your temperature check on that is um, that we, I think it just makes sense for us to start putting in the impacts now. So we're not just giving our committees blank lists and everybody has a right to put their impacts down that they see, but at least it's something that started and it might get some other ideas generated around impacts. Uh, so we will, uh, Kim and Kelly, myself, will start thinking of that and, and start filling in some of those impacts. And again, every single person on the committee has an opportunity to also talk about impacts and put those on there. And then we talked at the meeting about the possibility of when the uh, committees see both lists, the budget items for review and the ones that didn't make that list, by looking at both, uh, we want to leave some time just to generate some uh, some maybe additional ideas, because maybe there's some things that were on the uh, non-quantifiable or unviable list, but it maybe with just some different changes uh, could actually be measurable and put on the list. And, uh, and it might just spark some other ideas. Uh, so we'll set half of the meeting in February, we'll be around looking at uh, the budget items under review that we were able to put some uh, definite amounts to brainstorming impacts. And then the second part of the meeting, we'll be looking at both lists and seeing if, and then we'll just reopen the survey. So we'll ask people to bring their laptops and then they could just go in and add some extra proposals, which then um, we'll take back at a district committee, look at it and, and filter it again. 
And then I think we'll still even have time at the March meeting then to have people look at the impacts, where those additional suggestions fell on which list, and then have another chance to add their impacts to the one that made it on the budget item under review list. So I'm excited. I think we're really creating this iterative process. And um, you know, we had some real creative ideas too that were given. So I will uh, give you a further update on that. And then we have uh, the finance report. Uh, I'm sorry, was there any question around that or? Okay, you guys look like you're good. So. <laughs> So tonight I'm presenting the December 2022 um, financial update. Um, the general fund is on target at 31.74% for expenditures and 28.37% for revenues. Um, around this time, we're projected to be 33% um, that we would be spending as, a, as part of our budget. Um, I did do some comparisons um, as far as last year, where we were for December 2021, just to kind of see um where we are um in our budget and last year at this time we were at 29.41 percent expenditures so we're at 31.74 so we are spending more in fact we're spending um 2.1 million more than we did last year in december and those increases are coming from um, certificated salaries increased by 593,000. Um, classified salaries increased by 226,000. Benefits increased by 375,000. Supplies increased by 382. And purchase services has increased by 616. So that's a comparison of um, December 2022 and December 2021. Um, so I just want to make sure that we understand as we look at this budget, um, our fund balance is at 6.76% now. Um, we're getting closer to that 5%. Uh, it could still change. We're still, you know, in January. So we still have quite a few more months, but um, but it it is there. And we are above, you know, $2 million above where we were last year. So just want to make sure everybody's aware of that as we go along. Because a lot of times I hear, you know, you have a budget and then at the end of the year, you say you're going to be at a certain fund balance. You know, if you're going to be at a 6% or whatever, and you end up at 10 or 15 at the end of the year. Um, but, you know, we're, we are looking like we're projecting to spend our, bu our budget at this time. Uh, we do have a discrepancy between our trial balance and Kittitas County report uh, of, I think, I believe it was $4,772. That is payroll transactions that um, we had to do and um, what we call manual checks. We need to go back and do journal entries um, to fix those. So we'll be doing that. Uh, capital project revenue came in at 17.83% and expenditures came in at 15.41%. The fund balance is at 2.29 million. Um, that consists of the state match and the tech levy and assigned fund to support other capital projects. There were no discrepancies between um, the trial balance and Kittitas County Treasurer's report. Debt service fund revenues came in at 53.48%, and our expenditures were actually at 81.91%, and that is due to a principal and interest payment that was made on December 1st. And then our next interest payment will be in July of 2023. There were no discrepancies between Kitchess County Treasurer's Report and the um, debt service fund trial balance. ASB fund revenues came in at 25.48% of the budget of revenues and expenditures came in at 17.24%. Uh, remember, they like to budget um, for capacity for um, fundraisers. Um, the reconciliation between the ASB trial balance and Kittitas County Treasurer's report, there were no discrepancies. The revenue for or the private purpose trust fund is not a budgeted um, fund. However, the fund balance is at around $44,000 uh, as of December 2022. And there was no discrepancies um, with Kittitas County Treasurer's report. The revenues for the transportation vehicle fund came in at 2.43% because we do receive that money from OSBI in August at the end of the year. So you don't see a lot of revenue going into that fund during the year until um, the end of the year. 
and 17.64% expenditures. I finally get to say that we did purchase a bus and we did receive it. <laughs> I think I'm always saying we plan. Um, we were, um, we would like to purchase a few more, but it looks like um, availability is not going to be there except maybe for one. So we'll probably purchase one more this year, unless um, another one becomes available. There were no discrepancies between KSS County Treasury Report and the Transportation Vehicle Report. Again, I would like to remind everyone that this report is presented with the information I currently have and is subject to change as we continue through the year. I'd also like to remind everyone that revenue sources are used in their current funds for authorized expenditures and can't usually be transferred to be used in different funds unless authorized within the adopted budget and within the accounting laws. And that's my report. Do you guys have any questions? Kim, is my understanding that the transportation fund is completely separate from our general fund. So when yes. you say we purchased a bus, uh, that is not something that would be quantifiable on our million dollar budget. No, no. Discussion. As we look at that budget um, reduction, then the survey, you really have to look at um, transportation has its own revenue and can only be spent. Um, in the transportation department, which that is in the general fund, but for buses, that's in another completely separate fund and can only be spent on buses. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. Takes us to Kelly, enrollment report. Yes, good evening. So not not a lot of change on our enrollment. Um, we have headcount and we have FTE, so this month, uh, we have 3,223 students for headcount, but as we know, not all students go full-time. So as we calculate students that are either uh, part-time, that comes to um, our FTE of 3,111. So that is, we're down about 4.8 students, just about five students. And I can see that those are all secondary kids across all buildings. So it's like one or two in each building. Um, our ESL and our uh, running start uh, numbers are holding steady. Those don't change. I think you'll see more of a change next month when we have our second semester um, ships. You'll see more movement then. I will tell you that actually, um, you know, counts are always collected on the first Monday of every month. And we had our transitional by, uh, sorry, transitional kinder program, too many transitional programs, transitional kindergarten program that um, started after the beginning of the month. So we actually have 40 more kids in district right now, but they just didn't get counted because they weren't here on that day to count. So you're going to see a nice jump next month of another, we have 40 more. It's just not on this report yet. So uh, that's encouraging. And that is full allocation. So that's supportive of getting us closer to our budget and we're going to be pretty close. So questions. Um, would you remind us how you come up with the, the 3142, how we get to that um, projection? Absolutely, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> um, this last year when I did, um, prepare, I, when I prepared the budget, I just used last year's um, enrollment numbers. Because of the pandemic, it, it was such fluctuating so much and you really weren't sure where you were going to end up. Um, but a lot of times what you do is that you you look back, you look at back years, you look at what class sizes, um, are they going up? You know, who's graduating? What's the class side graduating? What's the class side coming up? And those kind of things. So that's what I'll be doing this year for the budget. Thank you, Kelly. Ah, thank you, Kelly. And that's, that is promising that 40 more students. That's awesome. So thank you. So board, we did get some exciting news. We have uh, finally have our certificate of occupancy for Mount Stewart. Yay! Um, and Damon Gardella is here on Zoom with us to give us an update for each of the buildings. Damon. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, board, for allowing me to present tonight. Um, a pretty short presentation. We're still working at closing all the projects out as superintendent Heber mentioned we did receive our our permanent certificate of occupancy from Mount Stewart today um I was really hoping to get uh the one for Lincoln today also I was pushing hard for it um the fire marshal responded with one additional item and it's really not work that needs to complete it it's 
he needs to see a a report of some um of what the building's doing been doing so anyway it's a it's a technicality just a formality type uh report we got to get over to him so we'll get that over so i still have my fingers crossed that we can get lincoln um certificate of occupancy very soon on ida we um we're getting close on that one also so as you recall the one open item on that was a utility easement unfortunately those aren't quick processes uh the good news is the surveyors have been up on site they did survey it they got the description for the uh, survey completed we have sent that over to your um legal counsel and they are now writing the legal description for that easement and once that's complete then we can submit it and file it with the city um and then once they um approve that then we'll have that item complete so that's still got a couple weeks left out on that one open item per ida but we hope to uh, hope to keep that moving get that off the books as well and then get this certificate occupancy for ida as well um over the break they did a lot of work in lincoln to complete punch list items um I, they still have like one or two items that are outstanding which are they had to replace some long lead items that they um ordered so we still have a couple items we're tracking but for all intents and purposes they were able to um complete the majority of that list at lincoln as well and then also over at mount stewart um we uh decided back in the summer that a a door installed in the autism room out to the autism playground would be beneficial and that had been ordered so that came in just before Christmas break and they installed that over the break as well. So that is an update of where we're at. Um, I'd love to answer any questions. Or do you have any questions for Damon? Uh, I think it's fitting that this is uh, Chester Jason White's uh, last board meeting and that we have that certificate of occupancy. So thank you for all of that uh, work that you continue to do. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you, Damon. Next up. Next is the surplus of unused buses. And I think Carol, is she still on? She is. Carol Christman, do you want to talk a little bit about that for us? She was on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. We can. Um, right. Um, so like Kim had mentioned, we do have three new buses on order. Um, according to our source, um, buses are not readily available. So there's a chance that we might receive one out of the three. However, we do have a surplus of buses. Normally when you order new buses, you also surplus buses out. Um, so we have made the decision to um, have three buses that are no longer running, um, go ahead and be pulled out of our inventory. Um, and we're still sourcing out on uh, how that might happen. We do have the ability to try uh, neighboring school districts to see if those are buses they would like to purchase from us. Um, and there's a couple of other ways to do it. Um, I think my last resort would probably be to surplus it to the public and see if anybody wants to buy it that way. However, buses that aren't running aren't probably going to be a big appeal because I, we are not going to be spending any, um, we don't have enough time or energy to be able to spend um, fixing them. So anyway, uh, it's just basic standard procedure to have buses surplused every once in a while. I have one question for you, Kim. Just if these are sold off, this would go into the transportation fund. It doesn't go into the general general fund, correct? Because of the buses that go into the transportation fund. So anything else, board? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, this is an action board. I move that we approve the surplus of the unused buses. I second. All right, Tasha moves that we surplus the buses. Jonathan seconds. I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Passes. All right, that takes us into policy. So, Board, this is our second reading of uh, this policy. It's an essential policy, one that we already have with some updates. And I did share this policy with um, uh, the appropriate administration and folks involved, and there were no concerns about it. So we're recommending adoption. I move that we adopt policy 2411. I second. Jonathan moves that we adopt policy 2411 and Madeline seconds. Any discussion? I will call a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Policy pass. Next up is policy. Yep. Next one is policy 3231. But we also, this is a second reading on this updated policy. It's an essential policy, and there were no concerns uh, about this policy um, from the admin. So we recommend approval. I move that we adopt policy 32, uh, 31. I second. Jonathan moves that we adopt policy 3231. Madeline seconds. Call any discussion. I just, I just want to note that these are the three policies that we've already seen before. They're essential policies, so they've been flagged uh, for us, and that pretty much the markup in all of these were just realignment with the RCWs that have been updated. So that's th this, these aren't big changes to our current policies. Correct. I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Policy, th policy 3231 passes. And uh, last, we are recommending the adoption of updated policy 3421. I move that we adopt policy uh, 3421. I second. Jonathan moves that we adopt policy 3421. Adeline seconds. Any discussion? I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Policy 3421 passes. Takes us to board reports. Tasha, do you have a legislative report? Um, I do have a legislative report, and next time it will be available as a PDF. I apologize for not being this time. Um, the legislative session has pretty much just begun. It is an important session because it's the biennial budget, which sets the budget for 2023-2025. Uh, Currently, there are more than 65 education bills under consideration. Some of them have been moving pretty quickly um, through through their committee hearings. Um, in the in the PDF, I gathered some quotes from the Senate's Education Committee, both from the Democrat side and the Republican side, of sort of what they're focusing on and what they what they believe that there is. Um, movement behind currently in Olympia. Um, both sides uh, spoke about special education funding. Um, so that is that is one that we should be paying attention to. Will, will Olympia fully fund uh, both the moral and legal obligation to serve all of our students? Um, there's There are the OSPI's uh, legislative priorities that have been shared out and that's fully funding special education, student transportation and school meals. School meals uh, gathered quite a bit of um, media play or coverage this last week um, as it went through the House Committee and the Senate Committee. 
so that is one to look to look at. Um, and both uh, that that those bills currently have um, both Republican and Democrat uh, support behind them right now. Um, people who signed on. Uh, OSBI has also said that they are asking the legislature to additionally support school counselors, nurses, social workers, and psychologists. Um, they also want to expand a teacher residency program, which will provide a full year paid residency program for, for teachers coming through, and then also strengthening the dual language programs for multilingual students and families. Uh, one part of the legislature that's not getting a ton of, of uh, exposure is the focus on the high school and beyond plan. Um, the State Board of Education loves the high school and beyond plan and often reminds us of it. And the legislature also, uh, when you speak to them privately, they also really like the high school and beyond plan. But there's been talks of revising that. And a lot of it is being led um, because since 2019, that class of 2019 in Washington State, only 43% of those students are projected to uh, have a post high school credential. And the numbers have gone down every year since. Um, so uh, there's a lot of focus on that from our higher ed partners and employers saying, what can we do to support students in find these, finding these viable pathways afterwards? So what will the legislature possibly revise on the high school and beyond plan? It's kind of interesting to watch. And along with that is more funding potentially for dual credit programs and expanding those options. But next time I will have those listed out for you. And I know you like it when I say House Bill 2450 and we can just follow it. So I'll have it in a PDF um, footnoted and sourced on that. Great, thank you, Tasha. Any questions, board? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it takes us to board chair update, and um, I'll just be brief. I just, uh, part of the budget committee, Ginger, you did a great job leading that discussion, leading that committee meeting last week. Was it last week? Oh, I forgot. Last week, um, I'm excited for the two different committees and the work that they're going to do. Um, I think uh, we've got a pretty good mix of community members, the staff and everything. I think it's going to be really beneficial for us as the board and you and Kim and Kelly and just all being part of trying to really help our district um, come up with the best plan, especially for uh, the budget reduction. Um, also, I believe we have a capital bonds committee meeting tomorrow night. So I'll probably have a report from that next time. Um, but yeah, so thank you. Thank you for uh, the leadership you're doing right now, especially with reaching out to the community and trying to get people involved with the budget uh, discussions that we have to have. So thank you. <laughs> So this next takes us to public comment. Um, Leslie, if you can get that, get us set up for public comment. Um, the board will allot up to 30 minutes as a total time allotted for public comment this evening. And each speaker will have up to three minutes of time. The board is not obligated to provide additional public comment time to accommodate everyone in, a, in attendance. The board is not obligated to respond to questions or challenges made during public comment period, and the board's silence will not signal agreement or endorsement of any speaker's remarks. In my capacity as board president, I may terminate an individual's remarks when the allotted time has passed. I may also interrupt or terminate any speaker who is making uncivil comments. Uncivil comments include, but are not limited to, obscene comments, comments that are defamatory towards another person, or commentary that is unwarranted, an unwarranted invasion of privacy. The, the board reserves the right to have anyone removed who refuses to adhere to the rules and creates a material and substantial disruption of the meeting. Personnel matters are generally private and administrative in nature. Constructive criticism can be helpful. At this same time, the board has con confidence in its staff and programs and will act to protect them from unwarranted criticism or disruptive interference. Complaints or concerns received by the board or any board member will be referred to the superintendent and will not be considered or discussed by the board in this setting. 
I'd ask that you respect, respect staff members' privacy and consider putting any concerns you have in writing if they pertain to personal matter. The board can then review and forward those on to the appropriate administrator. Leslie, are we ready for public comment? Okay, individuals in person wishing to be heard by the board need to be signed up to speak and those on the Zoom need, it, need to add their names to the document in the Zoom chat box. If you are unable to do this, individuals may be also recognized within Zoom by using the icon or emoji to show that you are raising your hand for public comment. Once the board chair calls an individual, they will identify themselves, stating their name and address for the record. Individuals will proceed to make comments within the three minute time limit. If an individual wants to request a response from the board, this may be possible by submitting the request in writing or email to board at esc401.org. So Leslie, if we don't have anybody in person, do we have anybody online? All right, for those on Zoom, if you wanna make a public comment, can you please sign up or raise your hand? We'll allow for uh, about a minute to see if anybody wants, wants to speak. All right, public comment, close public comment. Thank you. All right, takes us to new business. Adjourn to executive session if needed. Yes. So um, we need about just a little bit more time to discuss our candidates, correct? So um, how much time do you think you guys would like? Okay. So we'll adjourn, uh, go to executive session for about 15 minutes. So um, we will return at uh, 7.30. <clears throat>
All right, board, are we ready? Next item on new business. Voting for the selection of the new board member for dis that District 3. So the appointing of Jason Chester, Jason White's seat. Uh, so just as sort of a discussion point for for when we uh, the bo the board is once again faced with the difficult decision to appoint someone this really isn't a mechanism that a school board can deal with uh, uh, election of school board officers is actually one of the oldest institutions in our democracy and it really is meant to be sent to the voters so it is always a difficult decision when it comes to appointing and um, I always find myself in the quandary because I've been here a couple of times to, to a point um, that I can't possibly understand or pull the minds of all the voters for who they would have in this seat or for the candidates themselves to be vetted by the um, conversations or the questions that come up. Um, so it was incredible that eight people put their put their name in eight incredibly qualified uh, people in Ellensburg that's in a district. This isn't even an at-large seat. This is a district uh, seat, and all of the candidates really were incredible, and they all graciously came here for 15 minutes to answer questions. Um, but the process of of doing that is is difficult, and 15 minutes of asking questions and then reflective discourse amongst ourselves uh, to do the best possible appointment. Um, I, I think is I think it is messy, but we do have an election coming up this November. So seats on this board will be open um, in November. So my process of thinking of what we need at, at the table uh, has is what what is Ellensburg or what is this board um, facing at this time. And so when I ran five years ago, I ran against two other people and they did not have children in the district. And that was something that came up a lot when we went out for debates or town halls. And I think I was, I was, I tried to be very upfront and say that it didn't matter if you had kids in the district um, because this is a community, the, the school district is reflective of the community. Um, however, at this time for what Ellensburg is facing, we are not facing overcrowded schools. We are not building new schools. Uh, we are coming out of a out of a global disruption, um, which is ongoing on many fronts, and a significant educational disruption. Um, it, it feels like every month there's something new that is thrown at parents and students as to what it, what are you going to do after after uh, university or chat GPI shows up or Amazon comes out and says, we're not hiring college graduates, we're getting high school graduates if with micro credentials. It's very difficult to figure out uh, as a parent, uh, what, that, what, what does it mean to prepare your child uh, for the world today? And so I think it's imperative uh, to reflect and say which stakeholders that have direct influence on the classroom do not have representation. Um, and our labor groups, our teachers union has direct representation. Uh, our staff has direct representation. Um, who does not have direct representation? We have incredible uh, student board members who are leading the pathway for elevating that student voice. Uh, but I think we need parents with a sense of urgency to speak about what they want their child's day-to-day classroom experience looks like and what it does mean to be an Ellensburg High School graduate because the world has changed drastically. And so somehow we need to come together and set those goals because what worked 10 years ago is not what the world is looking for right now. And so we need to have a robust discussion about that. So to me, it was very important that uh, the candidate that whoever sits up here, it matters to me if they do have a parent, if they do have a student in the district right now. And that's just meant to start the discussion. Okay. 
I guess I, I do want to, I, I guess I, I feel that I need to push back a little bit. I just don't think that that should be an automatic. I, I don't, I, I feel like you have to have as broad a range of representation as possible on a board like this. And so looking for somebody that has a skill set that maybe we don't have already. And I think that really has to be um, something that we consider. All right, well, I just uh, thank you to all the candidates that did show up today. Um, we appreciate you taking your time, spending a little bit with us and uh, answering our questions as best you can. And thank you. So this is an action item, so. I would like to nominate Cynthia Toe, um, if that's how you say, to replace, um, Take Jason White's seat as district number three in district number three. Jonathan has motioned that we appoint Cynthia Coe. Do we have a second? I'll second the nomination. Jonathan has motion that we appoint Cynthia Coe and Tasha has second. Uh, this will be a roll call vote. Um, oh yeah, is there any more discussion around Cynthia Coe? I just think she adds uh, some elements that we're missing right now on the board. Uh, I believe uh, Cynthia Coe is a strong candidate uh, for the school board position. Um, she has uh, experience working in committees and in her professional life of, uh, how did she, she put it so very succinctly, um, and I'm going to get it wrong, uh, about when working discussions that there should be time for debate and discussion and to respect differing views. Um, her, her resume shows that she not only talks about, but she also educates that she's an educator herself. So I think that she would bring a strong perspective uh, to the school board. Anyone else? Okay, so it'll be a roll call vote. Madeline? Hi. Jonathan? Hi. Tasha? Hi. I will vote aye. So Cynthia will be the newest board member to join us. So congratulations to Cynthia Co. And we will make sure we reach out to her. If she is not on Zoom, we'll reach out to her and let her know. So thank you. That takes us on to proposed items for future consideration. Takes us to board calendar. Only thing I know of is we have another budget or not a budget, a capital bonds committee meeting tomorrow. So we usually do a February retreat as well or work session. Sorry, Tasha, not retreat work session. <laughs> Um, so we'll look around for a place and start doing a doodle poll to find out when when that works for you. And we'll try to play, find a place off campus to do that. Any other board calendar questions? Okay. Uh, it takes us on to clarification and next steps. I do not have any. Thank you. Ginger? Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yes. I just wanted to confirm that uh, my lap, the district laptop was returned to the district office today. So that way that can be passed on to the new board member. Yes, thank you, Chester. Uh, Leslie received that today. Thank you. 
And Leslie signing of documents. Awesome. All right. Um, before I call for an adjournment, I just want to say, Jason or Chester, thank you again. We'll miss you. Enjoy Arizona. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Takes us to an adjournment. I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Jonathan moves that we adjourn. Tasha seconds. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Gosh, it feels like it's a lot later than it is. Isn't it? I know. Maybe my energy is starting to. Has it been three hours since you? It has been. If you drink those regularly, does it like? I mean, do you feel I it? I drink them all the time. Oh, okay. Just like one night.